Good evening, and welcome again to Public Perspective. I'm your host, Kevin McDermott, and tonight, as we have done in the past, we're going to do a little bit of delving into history. Our guest tonight is Jonathan Stevenson. He's the president of the World War II Historical Reenactors Society. Yes. Jonathan, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to have you. Good to be here. So for those who, um, unlike me, are not familiar with uh, reenacting, and I've only just become familiar in the last few years, um, let's talk a little bit about what reenacting is and, and why people feel compelled to do it. So what happens at a reenactment? What goes on there? Well, there's uh, a lot of people representing wearing uniforms and equipment of uh, our World War II veterans. And um, sometimes there's vehicles included, uh, trucks, so on. Everyone wants to want a tank or so. And um, what they do there is uh, actually become like a, a, a 3D museum. And um, it's all a living museum. A living museum. It's all live action and, and uh, it's very much uh, uh, when the public is there, there's a lot of public interaction. You can come right up to a person and, and ask, what is this type of equipment? How is it, how is it used? And, and uh, my grandfather did something like this. This is very interesting to me. Uh, well, and I've noticed in the few reenactments I've been to um, that each of you takes on an actual character from the time, um, an actual person who would have been in the Civil War or the World War One, or in this case World War Two, um, and is that the case with you as well that you have taken on the persona? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, sometimes more when people do the uh, other nationalities, it seems a little bit more of a of a way to get into uh, character, if you will. And uh, when you're just representing, just representing your American servicemen from World War Two, and you're just kind of yourself, actually just an American. Mm -hmm. Dressed in uniform and right doing your duty. Yep. So how did you get involved in reenacting? Well, it's quite a, a long story, but um, we I have thirty minutes. All right. As long as that, we're in trouble. But as Hopefully long as we not. Can... Okay. I'll condense it. Okay. <laughs> but um, my dad was a World War II veteran. He was in the Marine Corps um, from 1941 to 45, and he was in the Second Marine Division and participated in um, four different invasions: the Guadalcanal, uh, the Tarawa invasion. Saipan and Tinian invasion. So, so these were all very fierce fights. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. And your dad went through all four of them. Yes, he did. And um, wow, that was quite an experience. He was never wounded or, or hurt real badly, but um, through all these, especially in the Guadalcanal campaign, he he uh, was so debilitated from all the different jungle diseases. I mean, mm -hmm. there was a, a list of diseases that he had, and that stayed with him his whole life. Um, he had. At, at times he had trouble walking, his joints would swell up real badly, just mm -hmm. after effects from malaria and all the several other things that he had at the time. So, uh, he, obviously he was a dedicated soldier because he went through all four of these yep. battles. Um, and he was a, what rank, was he infantryman? Was he, a, uh, he was a radio man. Okay. Well, isn't that one of the people that the enemy always went for first because they want to knock out the communications? I would think so, yes. So he he had a few a couple harrowing stories, but um, but uh, we didn't learn too much about that as as kids. But um, he 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 kept up an interest. He made sure we we knew about World War II. We knew about what he did, and um, we especially knew about some of his buddies that were killed in the war. And uh, we knew him by name, and he had pictures. And we could mm -hmm. since we were little, we could say these are the guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, growing up, then it's just and my brothers, we were always interested in reading about it. Um, and then eventually, as I got into my college years, um, I was a history major in college, and I started researching more and reading more. And this, of course, sadly, was after my dad had died. Hmm. So I was kind of trying to figure out who he was. Was that a result of some of these illnesses he'd taken with him from the wars in the Pacific? Pretty much, yes. I mean, he, he died about age 66, mm -hmm. so it's fairly young, I would say now. Yeah, yes, I would say that too, as I approach that age myself. But, but definitely all these uh, diseases took quite a toll on him. Uh, so what did you, uh, what were some of the salient things that you learned as you went through and you researched and you tried to figure out, you know, what had he been through and um, what were some of the, uh, I guess, uh, life lessons or, or that you pulled out of that having done that kind of study? The main thing is just never give up. <laughs> I mean, when I, when I read about 
some of the things that, that uh, the, men, hit the men he was with and, and he himself did, especially at Guadalcanal, was an awful place and uh, was just, you know, one step after the other and you just, you just can't give up. So that, that, that's kind of, I think, how my dad lived, the, lived out the rest of his life. He just never give up. I mean, he had he had those problems associated mm -hmm. with his joints and things his whole life. But I mean, he, he never give up. He raised four kids. Uh, he's always doing something around the house, fixing something. He just fixing the cars or or whatnot. So he he just never gave up. And and I see that now as uh, something I try to do as well. Now you brought along a whole bunch of things to display here. Um, so let's. Uh segue from from your dad and we'll come back to him because some of these things refer back to his own experiences uh you've got a couple of helmets here um they both look like they're american helmets but right. what's the difference why have two here? uh well these represent the the two uh main reenacting impressions that i do this this one is uh, a marine corps helmet it, it has the camouflage cover mm -hmm. and the other is uh, a u.s army helmet from world war ii and now, isn't that being both Marines and Army, isn't that like trying to root for the Cubs and the Sox? The <laughs> Absolutely <city>? is. <laughs> Absolutely is. So how do you choose which one you're going to do? Um, it's kind of a de facto thing. Um, if we want to have battles and, and, and at these reenactments and mm -hmm. things, which are quite fun to do, I must admit, we don't have a lot of, of Japanese to fight against. So well, they're not shooting real bullets, too. So right. It's a different exactly. experience altogether. Right? Exactly. And uh, so oftentimes our, our marine impression is mainly just for display and, and talking. So, mm -hmm. And our army impression oftentimes we actually do do the battles with the blanks and uh, with the Germans and so on. Uh, now, the ones I've seen, uh, there is generally um, a narrator, someone who's on the microphone right. announcing what's happening. And so one of the things I noted in, in these reenactments is that, first of all, the, the day-long event is many hours, like from 8 in the morning until 4 in the mm -hmm. afternoon. Uh, and the battles are very short, they're 10 minutes, 15 right. minutes, right. Uh, sometimes shorter. Um, and the narrator is explaining what actually happened in the battle. And uh, in, in this particular one where I saw World War I, it was describing just how horrible life in the trenches was. Uh, and I, what I took away from it is seeing these things reenacted, it's not fun in games. It's about trying to display to the people who are watching, and there are lots of people in the audience, uh, what it was really like and how horrible this, in this case, World War I, really was for the soldiers on, on the field. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm assuming that for the World War II reenactments that you do, that there's a similar kind of uh, ethic behind it? Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, there, is a, there is a lot of fun for us involved as reenactors. There's camaraderie and... Mm -hmm and uh, people of uh, similar interests and history nerds, World mm -hmm. War II nerds, if you yeah. will. But yeah, that is definitely one thing uh, we, we, we try, to, try to emphasize. And um, if we can get someone a spark going that they'll go back and find you know, another good book to read mm -hmm. and, and uh, delve into that a little bit more and understand what we were doing, that's, uh, that's our goal. And why is it important for people today, or in any age, but today in particular, why do you think it's important that people remember these battles and remember the wars as a whole? I mean, what do we need to know in modern times that we learn by looking back at these events? Well, I, I guess basically it would be we don't want to repeat that. I mean, we don't want to have to have my, my grandmother doesn't want to have to didn't want to have to send her son to the South Pacific and and get white hair over a period of a month. Mm -hmm. So did, I don't think did that really happen? That really happened. Her hair turned white. Her hair turned white. Wow. So I, I I've think, had years to work on this. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I don't think anybody really wants to do that. And, and even with all our recent fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan and all that, I mean, uh, I would just hope that people would think, you know, give peace a chance. Well, and to understand what's involved in a war and how difficult it is to be there and have to fight it. Right. So we've got um, some other things here. We have. Uh, in fact, right in front of us, we have this very dangerous looking right. piece of artillery. Uh, so explain, this is a mortar, right? So explain to me, what, what is this? Where would it be used? Uh, why was it? Well, <laughs> I know why it was used. But under what circumstances? Where would it be effective? Well, this is a 16 millimeter M2 mortar. And uh, this was used extensively 
by both the Marine Corps and the Army uh, throughout World War II. Um, <clears throat> some people call it a piece of pocket artillery. It's uh, two men could carry it around, and one man, if he was bulky enough, could carry it. It's fairly heavy. It's about 80 pounds or so. Um, it, it can be moved quickly and set up quickly. It, um, it's got a high angle of fire, so it could, say, you know, go over the top of a hill to the other side if there was a gathering of troops there or something like that. So basically, it was a very portable, uh, very dramatic weapon to use. Now, there's a, a shell. I don't know if we can, yep. cameras can see that, but there's a shell about the size of a, looks like a hand grenade with a tail on it. Mm -hmm. um, would it be about the same amount of explosive power as a hand grenade? Is it, uh, do you know? Um, I would say it's probably a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> it, it was designed, it was filled with TNT, and it was de designed to uh, shatter into, you know, a million little pieces mm -hmm. of shrapnel. Um, definitely, if that was raining down on you, you would... Uh, You'd want to take cover. You would definitely take cover for a long time. And these things could be fired pretty rapid succession. Every 30 seconds, they could, uh, they could fire one of these rounds off and keep that up for probably several minutes till the barrel got too hot. So that's a, that's a pretty intensive amount of explosives raining down on someone's head. So uh, again, did, did, how, how many per minutes could you fire these? One round every 30 seconds. Every 30 seconds. All right, so if you, if, if you had brought however many of these, a dozen of these with you on your uh, squad, um, so that's a dozen firing two a minute. So you're firing 24 uh, shots, 24 of these a minute coming down on the enemy position. So, if these were so effective, um, why is it, uh, well, I, I guess my understanding of, of the war, which is limited, <laughs> why you're here today, um, it seemed like this would be a very effective weapon that would have been used all, of time, all, all of the time, all over the place, and it would have been very hard to fight against it, but I'm sure there must have been a defense against a weapon like this. Uh, you know, just hiding underground, that's the, yeah. that's the, that's the only defense, really, yeah. frankly. Or calling in the air support. Right? It's just um, they weren't liberally spread throughout, you know, all the squads and platoons mm -hmm. and things. Um, I believe there was two per company. Okay. So they, they, they weren't in great supplies. Not in great supply. All right. Okay. So um, let's go move on, and we'll come back at some point to the, to the artillery. But uh, you've got some, some other things here, particularly some photos. If you want to explain what some of these would be. Well, these are photos of my dad's unit in, on the island of Tarawa during, the, during and after the fighting. And before we go further, you mentioned the island of Tarawa. Yes. And that's what this map is behind us. Yes. Right? Just so viewers have been wondering, what is that thing on the wall? Yes. That's a map of Tarawa Island mm -hmm. in the Pacific. Yes. The site of one of the fiercest fights. Right. And so this is uh, when, after they had invaded the island? This is... Yes, the, the, the fighting lasted about 76 hours. And this particular photo was about 48 plus hours into the battle. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a large shell hole here. And this is where one of the uh, <clears throat> colonels set up his command post. And these were his communicators. And this is my dad's unit. And they called it um, HNS2. What did that Headquarters mean? and Service. Second Marines. Okay. So was there any superstition involved? Did the uh, colonel who set this up, he set it up by a shell hole, figuring lightning doesn't strike twice, and that's the safest place? <laughs> that could be. But uh, there was still a, a fair amount of, of Japanese um, on the island hiding in holes and things like mm -hmm. that. So they did have some few pot shots taken at them, even at that late mm -hmm. stage in the battle. What year of the war was this? This was November 1943. All right, so the war was still raging in the Pacific. Yep, right? absolutely. Uh, and this was the um, campaign to take island by island, right? Yep, the island hopping. Island hopping, right. So um, let's segue from that to uh, the map behind us. You told an interesting story before the show about how this particular map was created. Right. Uh, my dad was actually a cartographer in his professional life, and he was contacted by an author who was, well, who was writing a book about Tarawa, and he offered to make a map. And the guy gladly took him up on that. And this was the result. 
we did quite a bit of research in the National Archives and so on, and uh, official reports and everything. And um, he has all the buildings as they appeared before the island was leveled during the fighting. And um, a few items from his memory. There's actually a couple of circles around that long pier, and those were shell holes that he um, was in. So that was all from memory. Maybe one of these. One of these. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and this particular map is a little bit beat up because I'd carried it around for a while. And uh, when I had was lucky enough to meet some Marines that had fought on Torala, I'd actually asked them to sign it in some location that on the map that meant something to them or, or had some memory involved. And I'm, the camera probably cannot pick it up, but I can see on the top end of the island by the pier that runs up the top, there are several signatures right there. So I'm assuming that that might have been where they landed. Yes, there, there's one kind of a little bit high. I don't know if you can see it. But that was Dean Ladd signed that, and uh, that's where he was wounded on Tarawa, and that's the furthest he made it in. Oh, my. After that, he had to. He has a, a great story in his book called Faithful Warriors. I'll plug that book a little bit. So. Okay. Great book. But uh, that's where he was wounded, and I had a great honor of meeting him, talking to him about the battle. Uh, it must have been very difficult to evacuate people who were wounded at this point. Well, you, you can see towards the top, there's a squiggly line. And that's the reef. Mm -hmm. And um, it was about 800 yards from that reef to the shore. And at this time of year, they didn't calculate it very well, but that was the lowest tide of, of the year. And uh, it was only a few feet deep most of the way. So the landing boats got stuck on the reef? Yes, they did. Um, they, they had two types. They had Higgins boats, which mm -hmm. were the flat bottom boats. And then they had some um, amphibian tractors. Tractors could get over it, but they just didn't have enough of them. And the Higgins boats, of course, got stuck on the reef, and a lot of guys, when they, that ramp would come down and the troops would come out, they'd just... Just mow them down. They would, absolutely. Uh, so, <clears throat> coming back to the map, though, your dad did this in, in what year? 1968. So that was long before the era of computers and computer-aided design. Yes. This is all done by hand. Yes, it was. It's a, a remarkable skill that mm -hmm. um, we don't see much of today. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm not sure the cameras can come in that close, but just the uh, the lettering and in the legend describing what's what is as clear as anything that would be printed on a computer today. This is all done by hand. Yep. So how long did it take your dad to research this and create this map? Uh, it probably took him a year and a half or so. And this was, uh, he did, usually did this late at night after work. Mm -hmm. And while he's getting kids to bed, he had right. his drafting table in one kid's room and he was up there drafting and working on this while they went to sleep. A remarkable labor of love. Absolutely. Uh, uh, and so now this particular map is contained, actually you might want to hold up the book that this is in now. Yes. So Bloody Tarawa. And that was a, it was considered an atoll, right? So it's Tarawa Atoll? Yes. Right. Um, and uh, how long the, the whole battle took I think you said 76 hours. 76 hours mm -hmm. from start to finish. Yep. Uh, now, what I'm curious about is um, why the Japanese, I mean, I'm sure during those 76 hours, it was an interminable time. But that seems like a sh relatively short period of time for a battle to take over uh, uh, a military installation. Did the Japanese not put up a good defense? Did they not have an air defense? Uh, what uh, what well, happened there? <clears throat> the Japanese had landed there sometime about December 8 or 9 mm -hmm. in 1941. And ever since then, they had been working on this, on that, that triangular shape there as an airstrip. Mm -hmm. So this was sort of an unsinkable aircraft carrier for them mm -hmm. in, the, in the middle of the South Pacific as they were, I guess you could say they were island hopping in the opposite direction. Yes, they were we coming were. out, we were trying to push them back. Right? So, so that was one of the goals, to get that airfield and, mm -hmm. uh, from the Japanese. But the Japanese, it was incredible defenses. They, the Marines hardly saw any Japanese. They were all in uh, concrete revetments, uh, mm. coconut log revetments. And some of them were covered with five and six feet of, of sand and dirt and logs. So uh, shells just couldn't reach them. Right. And it, there, there was a, a massive um, a naval bombardment, but literally some of the shells would bounce off and, and skip off the island. And there, there, after that, there was even a, a, a pretty massive um, uh, 
bombing campaign on there and, and the same thing. The, the one thing it did do, though, was it disrupted the Japanese communications. It was all um, telephone lines everywhere, mm -hmm. and so those were basically destroyed. And, and the good thing for the Marines, that left a lot of the Japanese isolated. And um, reportedly, the Japanese army was very top-down, and, and they could not operate in small little mm. groups. There, there was not enough autonomy for them to know right. what to do exactly. without command. Yes. So, so what the Marines had to do, they, they, as soon as they got a foothold, it was just inch by inch. They'd, they'd produce one bunker or one fighting position, and there would be another one and another one, and they just kept going till it was done. Uh, it must have been a, a terribly high toll in casualties on both sides. Absolutely. There was um, uh, roughly 5,000 Japanese and um, several thousand Korean laborers. And of the Koreans, I think 175 approximately survived. And um, for the Japanese, I think it was 17. Out of 5,000? Yep. Well, were they given instructions to fight to the death? Was they were. And uh, it, at some point when it seemed hopeless to them, they, mm -hmm. a lot of them would simply commit suicide. Kill themselves, all right. Um, one of the tragedies of war, I would have to point out, that here um, the sense was that to surrender would either be such an embarrassment or such a shame or um, that they would be tortured or they would be a, such a horrible life as a prisoner of mm -hmm. war. Not seeing that the end of the war was only a couple of years away and that no matter what had happened, in a couple of years they would have been freed and would be able to come back and be repatriated from wherever they'd been held to Japan um, and to be able to reconstruct lives. So one of the tragedies of war, to see no, no way out, when in fact there may have been one. Right. Yeah. Um, so coming back to reenactment, as people approach you and, and during these reenactments, uh, and they bring up questions like this, uh, is this the kind of stuff you hear from um, the people who come to see you, or, or is it more focused on, well, tell me how that equipment works, or, or tell me what your uniform is made of. Uh, how do the questions line up? Uh, generally, it's it's more about how things work and, mm -hmm. and what you wore. And, and like I said before, this reminds me of my grandfather. I I have a picture of him. I'd like to talk to you about him. So I'm asking the tough questions, right? I, <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, that is my job, after yes. all. I'm an interviewer. Um, so you've got a couple of other photos. Actually, we have some photos I think we can show as well. Um, if we can call those up, uh, we've got several photos of the, um, the reenactment group, right? Yes. So this is your uh, group of, of reenactors working. So here we've got the first shot here. That's a shot of our, our, our particular unit, which we represent the 9th Infantry Division. That's an mm -hmm. Army group. And that was so that would be this helmet up yes. there? Yes. Right? And that was in uh, Dixon, Illinois. Okay, and so um, Okay, and then this one is? Assume that's also our unit in Dixon, Illinois. And what were you doing? Dixon was a reenactment, I yes. imagine. Uh, so um, how many are in this photo? How many are in your group? In our, in our particular unit, we call yeah, them. Unit, right. We probably have about 45 guys. Okay. And so what would the actual Army unit have consisted of? Um, well, we try and represent a company. A company is around, uh, I might get the numbers wrong, uh, a couple of hundred guys. Okay. Yeah. We don't have that many, so we try to compress things a little bit. Mm -hmm. So we have things like there's a headquarters area with, with radios that the, they would have had there. There's another area with some Jeeps and things like that, another area with a mortar or, or, uh, or some type of other weapon. So we sort of try to compress things a little bit and, mm -hmm. and show people what a company would look might, like, have, might have looked like. Even though you, it's hard to round up three or four hundred people. To right. <laughs> so what, and we've got another photo up here now. Uh, and that is the same unit. Yes. Right? Just more of our men. There we go. And that's, a, that's the other unit that I'm involved with. That's the second Marines. And um, I did not start this group, but uh, uh, the other men involved knew of my interest mm -hmm. My, my interest in World War II and Tarawa and my father. 
So in kind of in honor of that, they decided to name it the Second Marines, and that's what we represent. Ah, okay. So your dad was, I mean, you've told me, it was a Marine or? Yes. He was in the Marines, okay. Yes. How long, and I actually, I, the camera briefly caught one of your sons coming over <laughs> and handing you the mortar yes. shell. So you've uh, had your, your family involved as well. I think that's very interesting. Yes. So is that is that top down or, or bottom up? Are they? <laughs> well, that's a little top down, I'd say. Okay. But they they enjoy it as well. There's a, a component. There, there's a camping component. We enjoy mm -hmm. that, and uh, while we do that, we also teach about World War II. So you actually camp out when you go to the re oh, absolutely, because absolutely. the soldiers would have right. done that, right? Uh, so, um, <laughs> how do you get all this? done logistically. In fact, it's one of the things I noticed when I went to a World War I reenactment. Um, there's a lot of moving parts. Someone has to plan that out. And you being the president of the society, is that you? Thankfully not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, does, it does take a lot of planning. But um, we have people that have been doing this for 10, 15, 20, and, and in some cases 30 years. Mm -hmm. So it's almost down to a science. And uh, we know pretty well how to organize these things. and. And uh, I'd say we almost churn them out in a cookie-cutter manner. So we have sort of a set mm -hmm. formula how we do it, and, and we try and transplant that to the different areas we go out to. So how often do you get new members joining up to be, to be reenactors? You know, usually whenever we have a, a public uh, reenactment, there's always at least one or two people that join. Mm -hmm. They say, this is really interesting. I never knew about this. I would love to participate. And you'd say... Sure, just go find yourself a uniform and some, <laughs> some gear. Well, come we on usually in. try, once they're hooked, we try to yeah. reel them in a little bit. Well, we say, well, we, we can supply you with uh, some, some trousers or, or mm -hmm. uh, a belt or something like that to get them started, get them interested, mm -hmm. and then, then we reel them in, and then they, <laughs> then they really lay out the credit card bill to yeah. get the rest of the equipment. Uh, which I imagine is, is hard to come by, even though it's World War II, it's not that long ago. How much of this stuff is still around, particularly uniforms and clothing deteriorates quickly? Well, interestingly enough, in the last 15 years, the reproduction World War II market has just frankly exploded. I mean, it's nearly worldwide, uh, re World War II reenacting. I'm, I'm, I'm very surprised by that. Particularly in the European countries, hmm. of course. But um, uh, India and China, there's a lot of uh, materials that come from there, uniforms and equipment and leather belts and things like that. And also in the, in the States there are several suppliers. So, so an interested person, we say, go to this website, we give them a card and say, buy this package and you'll be set to go. So, and mostly that's clothing though, right? I mean, the, right. the gear itself, like this mortar, I'm assuming that's the real thing, not a reproduction, right? Well, part of it's reproductions. Parts you couldn't otherwise get? Yes. Those things, yes, that's much more difficult to, to acquire. Uh, the weapons and so on, they're, they're around. Um, especially the, uh, the other reenactors will, will help a new person uh, find and acquire those things, legally, of course. <laughs> well, um, believe it or not, we're out of time. So what I'll have to say is I hope that you're very successful in recruiting more people. And I, I want to thank you for being on the show. I always learn so much when uh, guests like you come and educate me. So, Jonathan, thank you so much for your time. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you for joining us once again on Public Perspective. I'm your host, Kevin McDermott. You can find us every Saturday night at 8 on Comcast Channel 19 or find us on the web at publicperspective.tv. So, until next time, thank you and good night. Mm -hmm.